So we should not impose too much obligation on the on the developer. Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, Slovenian attorney and legal technology founder Marcel Haidt tears down his own contract for software development. This is an unusual episode as we see Marcel both as attorney and as client. He walks through his thinking on liability and priorities and what he knows as client needs to be an agile agreement. So let's tear it down. Hey everybody, welcome back to Law Insider's Contract Teardown Show. I'm Mike Whalen. The purpose in the show is exactly what it sounds like. We take contracts and we beat them up. Sometimes we're nice, but most of the time we're not. If we're being honest, I am here with my buddy Marcel Hyde. Marcel, how are you today? I'm doing fine. Awesome. I appreciate you joining us. We're doing sort of a sort of a weird twist on what we normally do because we're talking to you as both a lawyer and as buyer as contractor. So it's a real interesting thing. Guys, what we're talking about is this document here. Uh, this is a custom software development agreement. Uh, it's an agreement for services for software services. Uh, Marcel, uh, tell me about this document. Why are we talking about this specific document? So uh, if we, we go a step, a step uh, earlier, uh, I am basically a lawyer by, by the profession, a fully qualified Slovenian lawyer, and I'm also a legal technologist. Uh, I'm founder of Lex Ratio, which is basically a legal research and consulting institute, and we are uh, mainly supporting uh, startups uh, in Slovenia to enter the, the legal tech market. So this is also the reason why I decided to this agreement. And currently we are working on a project. We are building uh, a sharing economy, economy platform for uh, legal services to increase access to, to general legal services. This is the reason why I found this contract very interesting. Yeah, and that might answer the second question, which is why you? I mean, you, you've got this interesting background of both being an attorney who's looking through this as an attorney, but as I said, also as a buyer, which is really interesting. So what we're going to do, Marcel, is we're going to go through and look at some of these points and take it a bit as your consideration, both as the lawyer thinking through an agreement like this, but also as somebody who's having to hire somebody to do these things. Like, what are what are you focusing on? So so let's go through it point by point. We're going to start with number two. Uh, it talks about uh, the, the preparation of a development plan in section two. Talk to me uh, about what a development plan is. Uh, this sounds somewhat similar to what we talked to John Grant about earlier with an agile uh, software development plan, but, uh, but tell me about this section. What are you thinking about here? So basically, development plan is the first and very important stage before starting any real, uh, a real software development activities. And well-written uh, and prepared software development plan may avoid potential arguments and disputes in the future. So, for example, uh, our uh, software development plan um, is uh, is at the very beginning of, of the of the contract, and here there is not much much to say. It is well structured, clear, and uh, there is also uh, what is important that uh, if uh, you are also considering to start uh, any sort of uh, startup it is advisable to have at least an uh, IT friend or someone who is able to, to assist you when, when preparing the te technical details related to, to the development plan. So as mentioned, uh, here are only main points uh, which are going to be discussed uh, later on. Yeah, it's an interesting, again, we, we talked about this with John Grant, which is why I love having this conversation. Uh, you know, when you're doing these sort of software development plans, you have to have a weird balance of flexibility and boundaries, right? If you're talking about a contract, the whole thing is to identify the boundaries. But when you're doing software, you've got to have a lot of flexibility. So we'll talk through practically what that looks like for you. I like how this section starts with like, these are the big things that we super duper care about. You better make sure your development plan has that in there. If we look at section three, it talks about the acceptance of the development plan. So the developer is going to come up with, OK, this is what we're after. This is how we're going to do it. Uh, talk to me about section three and how you're thinking about this acceptance process of the plan once it's created. 
So section three, which deals with acceptance of development plan is basically a chronological consequence of preparation. So once the development plan is prepared and ready, customer should, uh, should have exactly agreed number of days to, to review it and to make some comments. With here, with this agreement, I would like to add that the second paragraph was initially not included uh, in the contract. So we added and tailored it to, for the particular, particular uh, case. So the right. second paragraph uh, deals mainly with, with the procedure and uh, give the customer additional safeguards uh, how to proceed in case the development, uh, development plan is unsatisfactory. So the last, as a last resort, uh, there is also a possibility to terminate the entire agreement. And what I didn't like about, uh, about the, the second paragraph is that, uh, that uh, the customer should pay all the sums for the preparation of development plan. I think this should be excluded at all costs since uh, we cannot, cannot uh, there is no fault on the customer signed for unsatisfactory preparation of development plan. Hey everybody, I'm Mike Whalen. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the Contract Teardown Show. Real quick, I wanna ask you to do me slash you really a quick favor. Look down below, you'll see a discount code to join the Law Insider Premium subscription. When you do that, you get access to more content like this. You'll see webinars, daily tips on contract drafting, not to mention access to the world's largest database of sample contracts and clauses. It will help you write better contracts faster. If you wanna do it right now, there's a code below, so get there. Also, if you're part of a larger team if you're in-house or in a law firm, just email us. We're at sales at lawinsider.com. We'll make sure you get a deal as well. Come join us in the community. The code is below. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, and, and it gives you, um, you know, even though you were the one drafting this, it, it sort of also gives you some duties to list out what was it that you didn't like about it, uh, which I like. You're being mindful of both parties, which I think is smart. Um, we, you know, there's a, a bunch in here in the next sections about the stuff that, you know, really is the basic, what, what are we paying, when are we paying, how are we paying kind of thing. But if we exactly. jump down to, uh, there's a bit about changes in scope and delays, uh, which is, you know, sort of common with these sort of agile development uh, methods. But if we go down to 11, uh, section 11, you talk about the acceptance, uh, testing of the software. So tell me how this is working. They've, they've gone out, they've built something, they bring it back to you. Is that what this section is talking about? Exactly. This is and this is basically the third stage. Uh, somehow, once the the software is is developed and installed on the on the hardware of uh, of the customer, here here is also necessary that the customer had, uh, for example, a certain amount of time to test the, the entire software and that he can he can object and uh, suggest how to repair certain processes and things. So. By this, this uh, uh, section, it was also necessary, similar to previous section, section three, if, I'm, uh, if I remember correctly, to add additional safeguards on the side of the, of the customer that he can object if uh, certain things are not, are not done properly. So this is mainly, mainly it. So it is really, really important that we have all these three stages. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, we're gonna skip past it, but I just, as an aside, I thought it was interesting uh, looking at number 12 uh, on the training section, since I, I deal with this a lot in what my company does, the onboarding piece, right? Trying to make sure that people can adopt it and know what they're doing. I like that you were explicit in here about how that's gonna work, who's dealing with that cost and and uh, who's gonna be part of that. If we jump down to 18, this you know always comes up when you're paying for the development of software. Talk to me about section 18, which is the ownership of software. How are you thinking about that? So this section 18 is basically uh, built out of four options and uh, the, the second and third options are more related to the license agreement. But the first option is, is basically what is the essence of, of every, every software development agreement. And uh, if I may just briefly read, uh, developer assigns to customer its entire rights, titles, and interest in anything created or developed by developer or customer under this agreement. So including patents and or other uh, intellectual property rights. Here I would like to add that um, also trade, trademarks should not be overlooked and also included not only patents and trade secrets and so on and copyrights. and. Um, 
as uh, as mentioned, uh, sometimes I also notice that uh, this uh, paragraph starts that developer shall assign to customer. Uh, we should avoid uh, the wording shall assign, uh, since uh, this uh, insinuates somehow that the 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 entire transfer is moved on on certain point in, in the future. So this make uh, a potential risk for uh, for the customer. So. There are also the the second and uh, and third uh, and third uh, paragraph within uh, within this uh, ownership clause, and I would like to add that uh, somehow uh, we should include certain type of um, of uh, back license clause or something like that in, in in case everything anything goes wrong. So in case the the entire software is not transfer. Customer need to have some certain safeguards that he can use in its entirety the whole software, which was basically prepared and tailored to his needs. Mm. So, this is this is in brief about the 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 ownership uh, customer ownership clause. And in as a fourth option, there is an interesting clause which is basically dealing with joint ownership. So, what does joint ownership mean? That may be somehow economically more attractive for uh, for for the customer, since uh, the developer is more personally involved in the entire project. And uh, basically, it is important that uh, the parties uh, divide shares on on the on, on the particular software. But as we know, that uh, startups are uh, uh, at the very beginning of the business; they are struggling financially. So this is somehow uh, an option to, to to get on board a software developer and to not to not invest so money in the so much money in the first stages of uh, of the business. Yeah, I was going to ask like as you're doing this, I mean you've got ors in here, meaning you're going to pick which one is appropriate for the context of the particular project yeah. that you have. But how are you so thinking basic. through that as a buyer? Like how do you in what scenarios are you deciding? Okay, this should be I own everything. This should be they own and they license to us. Or w which scenario should it be jointly owned? Where are you prioritizing? Like thinking about the project that you're working on now, are you leaning a direction? What's driving that? I we we will probably decide for the for the first option, so that we will get the 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 entire uh, the entire software. Since it is unique software and it is basically it, it will be tailored to, to our needs. So basically, any other option is not acceptable, especially license agreements. Uh, and to some extent, if if we could not uh, uh, evaluate financially uh, the, the cost, there is also an option that we will we will onboard the the, the software developer at least in some uh, small percentage. Got it. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about, you know, obviously, if somebody's got an almost completed software and they're adapting it to you, obviously, they should own the majority of that so they can use it in the future. But if you're paying for full development from scratch, right, uh, that's going to take a lot of money and, and that should that should come out. So uh, get, there are some sections in here that I'm looking at the source code access, which we've talked about in previous episodes, uh, some of these warranties we've talked about in previous episodes. But if we jump down to 22, section 22, in the intellectual property infringement claims, you've got some edits in here. Tell me how you're thinking about this section. So uh, IT contract often includes uh, IP indemnity clauses. So the reason is the fact that by just buying the developer's product, customer may risk uh, IP litigation. Uh, since this is merely an IP infringement clause, it would be also uh, advisable to extend it in, in some format. Uh, for example, if, uh, if a glitch in software results in, in personal injury or, or any, other, any other consequence, here, here for the moment we have only like uh, IP infringement clause, uh, so, uh, in the following uh, text of the first paragraph of this section, what uh, firstly came to my mind is term knowingly. I would try to, to avoid this term because it's too walk and uh, too walk and leave uh, quite open door for the interpretation. So, and uh, what is again missing, as we already discussed earlier, uh, is uh, our trademarks. Uh, trademarks are also very important uh, intellectual property rights and should be included uh, and covered under uh, IP. 
Hmm. Well, that's awesome. And, and as I'm, again, as I mentioned before, we, we've we talked about software agreements and, and development agreements in different ways. I, I, I'm thinking about in general principles as we wrap up, you as the buyer, you're in sort of a different position than what we've talked about as the lawyer. You know, obviously as the lawyer, you're trying to represent the interests of the buyer, but you are truly trying to change the technology landscape and the legal space in an area that is underserved. And so, you know, you want this development to work. You want this to be functional. You're not just thinking of this in terms of me as the buyer getting what I want. You're thinking about the ecosystem. You're thinking about the quality of the output of this software. So tell me in a document like this, I think this is about uh, 12 pages, 13 pages. How are you using this contract to maintain the flexibility that the developer needs to create something good, but also to protect your interest in what is a fairly new development product in, in the area that you're in, in the region that you're in. So basically what was, what was the main principle to, to, to be followed the, when drafting and preparing this contract is to, to balance somehow all the rights and obligations uh, on, on the each side. So as, as mentioned, the, the, the ownership clause is, is the, the most important clause and should be uh, very well drafted. But uh, as discussed, other, other terms should be, should be somehow in, in balance. We should not impose too much obligation on the, on the developer. And uh, on the other hand, uh, as, as a customer, we, we should have additional and necessary safeguards how to how to object and if anything goes wrong in the preparation stage, testing, confirmation stage, and and uh, and also once the uh, uh, we started to use uh, to use the the software, and uh, if there is any any necessary maintenance uh, needed. Yeah, it's interesting because I could see a developer bris bristling at this very you know, broad ownership clause, but it, that it's interesting because that gives you the comfort to say to the developer, actually, go do your thing, man. Like, go make whatever you're making. I know that I'm protected in the background by this very broad ownership clause, but that actually gives you, dear developer, the ability to go make what needs to be made. I think this is really interesting, the approach that you've taken here. I'm excited to see what you're creating. Uh, like we talked about in a, in a you know, legal technology is underdeveloped in every market. That's a side conversation, but uh, specifically where you are. So it's exciting to see what you're doing. If people want to reach out to you to learn about what you're doing as an attorney, but also as a legal technology founder, what's the best way to connect with you, Marcel? I would suggest to connect through through LinkedIn or or, or Twitter, but I am mainly present on, on all social, social media. So if you want to reach out and have any meaningful uh, conversation with me, with me about legal tech, uh, law, or or anything related, feel free uh, feel free to reach out. Very cool, and we'll have links uh, to Marcel's information, to this document, uh, to related clauses that you can find inside Law Insider over at lawinsider.com/resources. And if you want to be on the Contract Teardown Show to talk about what you're working on as an attorney or otherwise, just reach out to us. We're at community at lawinsider.com. Marcel, again, thank you for coming on with us. We will see you guys at the next Contract Teardown Show. Have a good one.